Well, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Uh, my name is AJ. I get to serve as one of the pastors here, and it is one of my life's greatest delights. And today we're going to continue marching through the book of Genesis, where we are beginning Genesis chapter 7. Is there anybody here that is willing to say, I have no fear in life? Anybody? I'm glad we're in a room full of realists, because uh, if so, I'd be inclined to call you a liar. Um, did you know one time that Jesus was terrified? The Son of God, who would come and take on human flesh and walk among us, the one who the Scriptures revealed to be the ruler of the kings of the earth, yet when he took on flesh and dwelt among us, there was a moment in his life where he was absolutely terrified. Have you ever been frozen in fear? Gripped by it, really, your, your mental faculties, your emotions, everything just kind of seems haywire. Or there's a moment for Jesus where he was so gripped by fear that the Bible actually says in his anguish he began to sweat drops of blood. It's a, a medical diagnosis these days, I think called hematidrosis, where you're under so much pressure and anxiety and anguish internally that the capillaries in your forehead burst and it appears as though you're Sweating drops of blood. Jesus experienced that. What was it that he was so afraid of? Luke chapter 22. If you've got a Bible, I would invite you to turn there with me. Wait a second. You thought we're in Genesis 7. We are. But we know the Bible is a story that is knit together, that whispers and really proclaims his name. So go ahead and turn with me to Luke chapter 22, if you will, and find this answer to the question, what was it that Jesus was terrified of? Luke chapter 22, begin in verse 42. He's in prayer, and he says, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And, and be, being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and he found them sleeping. Drops of blood. What was causing him so much distress? Remove this cup from me, he says. You could write this down and check, out, check it out later. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus, speaking to his disciples, says... We don't fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, we fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. It wasn't that Jesus was terrified to the point of sweating blood of the mocking that would come. It wouldn't be even the terror of knowing that nails would pierce his skin and a crown of thorns would be placed upon his head, the flogging that he would take before he would even go to the cross. None of these things were what were driving him to such a despair that would cause him to sweat drops of blood out of anguish. Rather, it would be the wrath of his father being poured out powerfully and precisely upon him, one man, for the sins of many. Psalm chapter 11, verse 6, refers to this cup that Jesus speaks of. If it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Psalm 11, verse 6, reveals that it is fire and sulfur and a scorching wind concentrated in the cup of God's wrath. Today, as we look at Genesis 7, we approach arguably one of the most horrific scenes in the whole Bible. And I, I don't want that to be lost on us. I would even argue outside of the crucifixion of Jesus and the final judgment that we read of in the book of Revelation, the flood is the most horrific scene that we'll find in the pages of the Bible. Now, I wonder, though, what it looked like to you when you think about Noah and the flood. Maybe you have something like this come to mind. I grew up looking at pictures like this as a child. Maybe you did, too. A pretty scene. Animals looking over the edge at all the waters, and, oh, look how serene and beautiful it is. But if that's the scene that you have in your mind, my hope is with God's help that will be crushed and we'll have a more realistic view of the wrath of God. The familiarity of this story removes the shock of it. But if you catch wind today of news around the world of 
massive floods taking out villages and killing thousands of people. And our eyes are drawn to that because it's so shocking, yet that would even pale in comparison to the view of Genesis chapter 7. It was a global graveyard. And we should treat it as such. I wonder if you've ever taken the time to walk through a graveyard before. An uncomfortable place, for sure. But as you walk through and you look at the tombstones, you see names and you see years. Sometimes you see... um, a comment that would mark that person's life. And I've tried to make it a point to walk through graveyards regularly as I'm I'm performing a a funeral or I'm traveling the world and I'm walking the street and I see a a graveyard off to the side. I I like to walk these to remind myself that my life is short. Uh, One of the things that Pastor Will encouraged the men with yesterday was a poem from C.T. Studd. We've heard it often here. Only when life will soon be passed. Just like that. The Bible says it's like a vapor, a mist. Here today, tomorrow is gone. Do we live like that? Graveyards cause us to think deeply about our own mortality, about the reality that one day that's going to be us. And the things that plague me today or the things that draw me or woo me today, are they going to be wooing me on that day? And I hope that this global graveyard of Genesis chapter 7 will cause us to think deeply about the lives that we get to live today, whether today be the last Or maybe we've got a few more decades to go. This would have stirred the Israelites. You'll remember the ancient, original audience of the book of Genesis in similar ways. They had heard myths from before, having come from ancient Near Eastern cultures in Mesopotamia, 400 years through Egyptian slavery, not just under the oppression of Pharaoh in Egypt, but also under their myths, religion, stories, the gods as they would see them. And God would be undoing so much of their understanding through the story of Genesis to point them to the realities of who he truly was. And as he pulls them from slavery and leads them to the promised land, he wants them to know who he really is. But we know the Bible is timely for them and timeless, thereby able to be applied to our lives by the Holy Spirit. And and just as maybe there were some myths of the flood for them, there are probably misconceptions or misunderstandings among us Today, but by God's grace, we find the truth in Genesis chapter 7. As we read throughout the Bible, hopefully we're growing more and more to be Bible people, you'll discover that God's judgment or chaos or darkness or evil are often represented in waters. Well, that wouldn't have been the case until Genesis 7, but the Hebrew mind would have often seen waters as, as evil, as darkness, chaos, something to be feared. It often symbolically represented the wrath of God. And that mindset started with this flood narrative. Now, God's wrath, as we see, it overflows like a boiling bowl. But unlike a directionless stream that burns everything in its path, we'll find that God's power in wrath is, is actually very different. We don't turn to the text and find some God on a cosmic roid rage, demolishing everything in his path. We don't find one who has lost control of himself as if he is some divine Bruce Banner that has turned into a divine hawk and is just destroying everything because he can't control himself. Now, actually, what I would propose to you from Genesis 7, the big idea is that the expressed anger of God is both powerful and it is precise. I hope you've taken time over the last week to read through Genesis 7. We put it on the loop every week for you to do that as you're wrestling through the text yourself, and we'll understand that God's expressed anger is balanced, it is just, and it is appropriate. And so in light of that, I would invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 7 so that you can see God's expressed anger on display for yourself. If you've got a Bible, go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 7. And once you have it, go ahead and stand with me, if you would. If you're capable, if not, that's okay too. You know, we are in a culture where we stand for things that we honor, which is a good thing. Uh, What ought we honor above the word of God? So Genesis chapter 7, I'll read from verse 1 all the way down to verse 1 of chapter 8. If you've got it, say, I got it. Then the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and his mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of all the earth. 
For in seven days I will send rain on the earth, 40 days and 40 nights, and every living thing that I have made, I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the flood of the waters came upon the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him went into the ark to escape the waters of the flood of clean animals and of animals that are not clean and of birds and of everything that creeps on the ground. Two and two, male and female, went into the ark with God as God had commanded Noah. And after seven days, the waters of the flood came upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth and the window of the heavens were opened and rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. On that very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons that with them entered the ark and they, they and every beast according to its kind and all the livestock according to their kinds and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature, they went into the ark with Noah two and two of all flesh in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded, and the Lord shut him in. The flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep, and all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swam on the earth, and all mankind. Everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark, and the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth and the waters subsided. Lord, this is your word. It does not shy away from who you are. It does not shy away from the works of your hands. In fact, it celebrates your swift and just judgment upon sinners and a world that has been broken by sin. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes to behold wondrous things of your word and cause us to marvel, give us clarity of mind, soften our hearts, Lord, to follow you with all of our lives until Jesus returns or calls us home. So open our eyes, Lord, as we open your text. We ask it in Jesus' name. God's people said. You can be seated. The expressed anger of God is powerful, and it is precise. But how does he deal with his anger? You'll remember a few weeks ago I shared with you um, the doctrine of God's impassibility, meaning that he does not have passions as we have. When something stirs me and angers me and I fly off the hinges and go wild, and then the dust settles and I settle a little myself, he's not like that. His expressed anger, unlike ours, is both powerful and it is precise. And in this text, we find the marks of God's anger. Let me share them with you. First, we discover that God is careful with his people. By his mercy, we thank him for that. But we also recognize that he is fierce toward his foes. And lastly, we discover that he's faithful to his promises. We'll take these verses and march through them over the next couple of minutes, and my hope is to convince you from the scriptures that God's expressed anger is both powerful and precise, and we see these these realities, these marks, that he's careful with his people, he's fierce toward his foes, and he's faithful to his promise. So go ahead and look at Genesis chapter 7 again with me. We'll jump around a little. We'll start in verse 1. Genesis chapter 7, verse 1, the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Skip down to verse 4. For in seven days I will send rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And verse 16 says, Those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. The Lord shut him in. 
Thus, the point that I think Moses is intending to make, and we could say this several different ways, but I want to share it with you in this way, that God in his expressed anger is precise, and we see that as he's careful with his people. He's not blown off the hinges. He's not the divine hawk smashing even his friends and family. He's careful with his people. Before the blood, the flood began, we find God preparing his people. We read about it earlier last week. We see it again here in verse 4 and 7 days. He's telling them it's coming. He's forewarning them, ultimately to forearm them. Some scholars even believe that this is God giving his enemies one final chance to turn. Seven days. You think about how odd this would have been. A, a worldwide encompassing flood is going to overtake a dry and desolate land. The people would have mocked at Noah, laughed at him. But he still gave them seven days. There were 120 days, years rather, to build the ark, some would say, and seven days to fill it. You just think about this, and it is mind-blowing in, in a lot of ways. Verse 16, God's careful with his people. We see, look at it again, chapter 7, verse 16. And they entered, and they went in as God commanded him, and God shut them in. Now, what does this tell us about the character and nature of God? What he's capable of and what we're not capable of. It tells us that he alone can seal the believer from his wrath. That we're not capable of doing that. You'll know, if you read the account, that God had instructed Noah to seal the boat with pitch all over with this sappy-like substance to seal the, the cracks and keep the water from coming in, but yet when it came to shutting the boat and sealing them truly from his wrath, who would be the one to shut the door? Well, in the Gilgamesh epic, who was a man of renown for ancient Near Eastern peoples, they would have read one of these myths of the flood, and Gilgamesh would have been one of the, the myths, and according to his epic, it was the hero of the story, the Noah-type character who sealed the door, but we know the scriptures tell us that God alone would shut the door and would seal them from his wrath. The Israelites are learning more and more about the character of God. What I want to do for a moment, and a couple of times throughout the next couple of minutes, is to pull back from this text and show major themes throughout the Bible. Uh, we call that biblical theology, where maybe you've been reading the Bible before, and you've, you've gotten your feet underneath of you a little bit, and you read something, and you're like, that reminds me of this over here. And you turn back, and you realize, like, wow, this is saying like kind of the same thing, but in a different book, different time, different author. Like, how is that possible? This is biblical theology when we see themes coursing throughout the scriptures that only God was able to, to string together. We know, right? There's 1,500 years from Genesis to Revelation. There's 40 authors, three languages, three continents. One story, the story of God saving people from his wrath through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. That's the flood account. It points us to these realities. And I want to kind of pull one of these themes out from verse 16. God shut them in. This is not the first or rather the last time that we'll see God providing safety behind a door that he has provided. You could write these down. Genesis chapter 19, verse 10. Lord willing, we'll get to that in a couple of weeks or months, where Lot is in the middle of Sodom, a wicked city and He's entertaining angels, and they want these angels. They want these men so that they can be with them in wicked and sinful ways, and, and Lot is dragged inside from these angels behind the door so that they would be unable to get to Lot. God rescues Lot behind the door. Exodus chapter 12, this would have been very familiar to the, these ancient Israelites. You'll know the story of the Passover where God would sweep through the village and would kill all of those who hadn't shed the blood of a lamb and, and placed it upon the doorpost. And those behind the door, God would have passed over and they wouldn't have experienced his wrath. Certainly this is going on in the minds of these Israelites as they're hearing the story of Genesis. Joshua chapter 2, Rahab the spy is told by the Israelites, when we come back in and destroy Jericho on behalf and on the name of our God. Stay behind the door and you'll be saved. Ultimately, we know Jesus is the one that fulfills this door. In John chapter 10, verse 9, he says, I am the door. And if anyone enters by me, he will be saved. 
the door. God provides, he seals, he guards, and we stand behind the door in faith. Do you doubt your salvation, beloved? Like if you're a follower of Christ and you have turned from your sin and you've placed your trust in Christ alone for salvation, the Bible says that you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption. But do you doubt that? Now, if this narrative would have told us that it was, in fact, according to Gilgamesh, that the hero of the story was the one that sealed the door, then I can imagine Noah and his crew, when the, when the waters bore up the ark and the, 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 the bones of the boat start shaking and rattling, they're probably thinking, that door ain't going to hold. But God shut the door, and they had faith, and they made it through. In our minds, who shut the door for us? According to your salvation, who shut the door for you? If you did it in your mind, then that door is going to blow off the hinges. But God did the sealing, and because he did, it is certain. We see that his expressed anger, though, is not just precise in how he's careful with his people, but he's also powerful with his target. Look at Genesis chapter 7, again with me, verses 10 through 12. Genesis chapter 7 10 through 12. After seven days, just as he promised, the waters of the flood came upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 16th day of the month, why would he put these details in here? He wants the reader to know, both then and today, this was a real man during a real time. At this real time, the windows, or the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened and rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Now skip down to verse 17, if you will. Genesis 7, 17, the flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. And the waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep, And all the flesh died that move on the earth. Birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth and all mankind. Pause, you'll notice this is the same order of the creation account. God is undoing his created work that we find in Genesis chapter 1. Even mankind, everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out. The Bible doesn't shy away from who is responsible for this judgment. God blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth, and only Noah was left and those who were with him. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. Not only do we see that God is careful with his people, but he is fierce, fierce toward his foes. He did not hold back. This was the worst possible punishment, and it was in order. Because they had offended a holy God, their creator, the the supreme being of of all things. And the punishment would fit the crime. If not, then God wouldn't be just. It would require such a payment. The ground would burst forth. The skies would crack open. Unlike anything that we could ever comprehend or imagine, destruction would take over quickly. And suddenly we begin to realize how Those images of old, maybe from Sunday school, were way off. This would have been a terrible scene, fearful, frightening scene, even, I would argue, for Noah and his crew being overcome quickly. Genesis chapter 7, verse 11. Some details and possibilities I want to pull out for you. On that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heaven were opened. Fountains of the great deep burst forth. The windows of the heavens were opened. Now you remember in Genesis chapter 1, 6, and 7. Um, let's go ahead and turn there, just so you know. The reference, highlight it, draw lines. Genesis chapter 1, 6, and 7. God is undoing. He is uncreating. Genesis chapter 1, verse 6, God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were 
above the expanse, and it was so, thus giving us this likely image that as God separated the dry land from the waters, a presumable canopy of waters in the heavens, a presumable collection of the great fountains of the deep below. And the Bible says, the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of heaven were opened. Now some would speculate there's so much pressure and tectonic plates and things happening beneath the crust to the surface that there would be explosive force that would pierce the canopy of heaven and thus drop water from below and flood the earth from below, above and below. We don't truly know, but the, the Hebrew writing doesn't necessarily stimulate today's imagination. There would be no way for us to grasp the amount of water that would have rushed upon this scene all over the world in such a short period of time and in an effort to stimulate our imagination, to move away from Sunday school teaching and look at what may have been a little more realistic. I want you to watch this brief video. know what this narrative would have looked like, but I would propose to you that the violence depicted in this video was far more accurate than what we find in Sunday school teaching of the past. And this is why. Let me explain this to you. If you look at Genesis chapter 11, verse, um, verse 18, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 7, four different times we're going to find this word that's rendered in the English as prevail. Genesis chapter 7, verse 18. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth. Verse 19. The waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. Verse 20. The waters prevailed above the mountains. Verse 24. The waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. Now this Hebrew word uh, would have been gavar, a verb that would, have, would mean to prove superior. These waters are proving to be Superior, but in this text they're used as a noun, more like a, the gibberum. If you've heard of the mighty men of old, the gibberum, it's literally saying these mighty men were, these waters were like mighty men prevailing over the dry ground. The dry land is mentioned in chapter 7, verse 22. And as we read this more and more, we understand that it is true how fierce God was toward his, his foes. The Israelites, the original audience, they would have been the ones to walk through the Red Sea on dry land. And when they read of God's uncreating as the waters prevail over the dry land, certainly they would have remembered that the enemies of God were smashed in his fury as the walls of the Red Sea would tumble in on the Egyptian armies who were pursuing God's people. God is again here in Genesis 7, consuming the violence that filled the dry land. Not only is his expressed anger precise, but it's powerful. But the ark isn't consumed. Verse 18, look at it. Genesis 7, 18. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. This word in the Hebrew, floated, is often translated as walked. And despite the wrath of God being poured out upon his foes, those that had trusted him in faith are walked upon the water. What does this tell us? It tells us that the ark of safety, the ark of safety alone shields sinners from the wrath of God. This is the good news of the gospel right here in Genesis chapter 7. Beloved, if you are in Christ, this God is your defender. We find hope in this as we turn lastly to Genesis chapter 8 verse 1. God's powerful and precise anger isn't poured out on all. Genesis chapter 8, verse 1. 
But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark, and God made a wind blow over the earth, and the waters subsided. Not only do we find that he's careful with his people, and he's fierce towards foes, but he's faithful to his promises. We realized last week, the week before, that the violence that would have filled the earth, God created the earth, he formed it and he filled it, sending his image bearers out, to inhabit the world and to display his glory. And when he looks upon the earth now, it's filled with violence, and he grieves this to the heart. But his pain doesn't cancel his plan. Why? Well, because we know that God functions with a big picture. We stare at an impressionist painting in the little detail, and we miss the whole picture because we're just focused on a small point. When God gives to us the scriptures, we must read this text in light of what the whole Bible says. Even we see this symbolized. These waters are stirred regularly by God's grace, where sinners hear the call to turn to Jesus in faith, and they repent and believe, added to the church body, and they're stirred to uh, in baptism, uh, being welcomed in, but publicly identifying first with Christ before they publicly identify with his People And baptism is a chance for us to see Genesis 7 over and over and over revealed. The waters would represent judgment all throughout the scriptures. This first world in Genesis chapter 7 is baptized in God's wrath. 1 Corinthians 10, 2, Paul would say the Israelites were baptized into Moses. And Jesus, we know later, would be baptized into the waters of judgment where the two come to him and and he says, are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? Are you able to take the baptism with which I will be baptized? He's talking about the point at which he will hang upon the cross and this cup of God's wrath that he has feared, sweating drops of blood, he's going to drink every last drop so that whoever places their trust in him alone wouldn't experience the wrath of God but would know the promise of of his forgiveness, and the hope of heaven. First Peter describes Jesus as the ark of safety. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says he will come again. And in so doing, he talks about his second coming being like Noah's flood. The, the flood account points to Christ. We'll look at next week this covenant that God makes with his people to never flood the earth again. But we can't confuse that with the reality that he didn't promise to never bring judgment again. In fact, the opposite is true. We are in this already but not yet season of life where if we're we're not careful, we just kind of kick the can and live life day by day as if no judgment is coming. But the Bible speaks to these things otherwise, that it is, it is pending, not with water, but with fire. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 3, and we'll see how all of this ties together. 2 Peter chapter 3. Peter, writing to those suffering saints in Rome at the time, is, is using the final judgment as a way to bring them hope to live faithfully in light of the end and to expect the judgment that God has promised. Very similar to that of Noah's day. 2 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 1, towards the latter part of that, he says, In both of these letters I've written to you, I'm, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the prediction of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For They deliberately overlook this fact, that though the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, a reference to Genesis chapter 1, and that by means of these, the world um, that then existed was deluged with water and perished, the flood of Genesis 7. But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept under the day 
kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The mercy of God is on display in verse 9 when he says the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but he is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. And he continues. You know, when we read Genesis chapter 7, and we see God's judgment upon the world. When we read in the book of Revelation, or even 2 Peter, when he's talking about the judgment that come by fire, it might feel a little crazy to us. Admittedly, fine. But we have to consider what the Bible says and let it be our authority. Not our experience, not our tradition, not our logic, not even what our culture would say about what, what is right judgment, what is wrong judgment. The Bible alone stands with authority to say, God is intending to come. And he will judge those who are far from him who have rejected Christ. Just as if they were in the days of Noah. God waited patiently. 120 years he waited patiently. But the day of judgment would come. And come it would. Today, it is as if we are in the days of Noah. And we look at this text, we must realize that God's wrath is not the problem in the world. It is the answer to the problem in the world. Do we have any fear when we look at his powerful and precise anger expressed through judgment? We should. And that fear ought to drive us to Christ where we recognize that he has poured out his love for us. Where he would pour out his judgment upon sinners, he pours out his love on those who turn to Jesus. So if you've turned to Christ for salvation by faith, and we live in the days of Noah, it means that God has called us to live long obedience in the same direction. When will judgment come? Noah didn't know. Day by day. Cut the wood, lay it down, form it, go get more. Cut the wood, lay it down, form it. Cover it in pitch. Wait, work, wait, work. What are we doing with our time? God has called us not to build a boat, but to go into all the world and make disciples. It starts with our neighbors. It goes to the nations. There is coming a day when judgment will reign, and those in Christ will be cared for forevermore. The sins of this world, the, the grief of our hearts, the pain that we experience day by day will be gone as Jesus wipes every tear from our eyes. But those apart from him will experience his divine and eternal wrath. This is a terrifying text. This is a horrific image. And those in Christ should be driven to joy knowing that Jesus absorbed this for us. And now we get to be heralds of his grace. So I don't intend to know what the next step is for everybody in this room, but I know that there is one. Take that next step. Maybe it's following Christ for the first time. Maybe it's just talking to somebody about the stirrings in your heart. Maybe you've been following Jesus for years and you got a little lazy. Pray that the Spirit would press on your heart to know, Lord, as I'm living in these days of Noah, what would faithfulness look like for me? Because when we stand on the golden shore, we'll look back, and every effort we've made, every sacrifice attempted, we'll know it was worth it all. I wish I had given more. So may we live in light of that until he returns or calls us home. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your people. Thank you for not shying away from hard and uncomfortable and terrifying truths. Lord, I pray that as we move forward in the book of Genesis and we see your kindness abounding and the fact that you would preserve Noah and the seed of the woman would continue because we know ultimately that Jesus would come from this line. Your mercy reigns, but so does your judgment. And so I pray that by your spirit, you would cause us to live in light of who you truly are. That we would not worship a God that we formed and fashioned by our own minds, but that we would worship you, the one true living God, the maker of heaven and earth, the one whom, whose word we hold in our hands and consider today. 
So cause us to walk faithfully, Lord, day by day. Whatever the next step is for me, Lord, stir me by your spirit to walk in obedience, that Jesus would be made known and worshiped in my heart, in my home, in the heart of every person in this room, in the home represented here, to the ends of the earth, because you alone are worthy, oh God. Stir us away from the the delicacies of this world that draw us away from Christ. Uh, May we become more like him and less like the world around us. Cause us to lift our eyes and to live in faith knowing that you're worth it all. We pray these things in Jesus' name and God's people said.